Deputy Chair, we need to have a serious uh, review of the way this country is run. And while I won't pretend to be able to stop the transmission of airborne viruses or change the climate, I can use my financial controlling skills to review the way that government operates in this country. And one of the things we have to do in this country is actually have a serious federation convention to look at the excess bureaucracies in this country. Time after time, I go into estimates and I get stonewalled by bureaucrats with the smug grins on their faces, taking uh, questions on notice, refusing to answer questions, complaining about answering questions. And that is an utter disgrace to the hard-working Australians whose taxpayers pay these bureaucrats. And we need to look at reforming our federation that is going to streamline uh, the, the roles and responsibilities of both state and federal governments to look at the vertical fiscal imbalance and the duplication of services given to the Australian people, because the Australians' taxpayers' dollars matter. And let me tell you, the brown bags of yesterday, the brown paper bags of yesterday are today's green tape, red tape, black tape, blue tape. You name it, there's a bureaucrat out there somewhere rorting the system with unnecessary rules and procedures that are destroying uh, the entrepreneurial ship and the aspiration that our Australian people so badly need and deserve. So uh, this federation convention that we have should be broken into constitutional changes and non-constitutional changes. Clearly the non-constitutional changes would be much easier to change. Uh, and, and I'll give you one example of where we could look at is the way federal funding uh, for road, uh, funding for federal highways is funded. Currently, the federal government funds 80 per cent of the federal highways, uh, and the state government funds 20 per cent of the highways. And then the state government goes on and pays generally a foreign uh, contractor to build those roads. You have to seriously ask uh, why we have foreign contractors building these roads and why we couldn't get the federal government to fund these roads 100 per cent and then have a civil engineering corps in the army. That wouldn't require a change in the constitution. All it would require is a bit of common sense and willpower between state and federal governments. Now, the next thing we need to look at is our taxation system. Our taxation system is inherently flawed to give tax concessions to the wealthy and to foreign interests. We need to look at closing the loopholes with universities under section 51 of the 97 Act. We need to look at making sure everyone pays their tax. We have 855 of the 97 income tax that says that if you're a foreigner and you make a capital gain on non-real assets, and that includes the sale of water rights, you don't pay capital gains tax. We have to look at Aboriginal land trusts and see why they don't have to pay tax on native title uh, royalties and mining royalties. We have to look at the 128F uh, of the 1936 Tax Act. It's called the public offer test but effectively allows foreign banks to earn interest here in Australia and pay no tax on it. And most of all, we have to look at our withholding tax system in this country that has a higher tax rate for onshore earnings than it does for offshore earnings. And I'll just give you one example of how this works. We've got here the, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission report from Pfizer on June 30, 2022. In June 30, 2022, Pfizer had a revenue of $100 billion for the year to for that 12 months. They made $34 billion profit before tax. They had an operating uh, ratio or profit ratio of 34 per cent. Now, if you go and have a look at the Australian set of the financial Pfizer accounts, they made a profit of $1.3 billion, uh, sorry, revenue of $1.3 billion, but only made $94 million in profit, i.e. their operating profit ratio was only 7 per cent. Now, you have to ask yourself, why did Pfizer only have an operating profit ratio of 7 per cent here in Australia, yet their worldwide operating profit was th uh, ratio was 34 per cent? I will tell you why, because the rate of tax in Australia at 30 cents is more than twice the rate of tax on interest royalties and rent paid offshore. So what Pfizer has done, and we can see this, the, the trick the way you read these accounts is you go in to related party payments. And if we go to the back of the accounts, you will see that there is an uh, outstanding figure to Pfizer Island, uh, Pfizer Service Company Island, of $1.1 billion. Now, why would they actually pay Island $1.1 billion for services? Because Island only has a company tax rate of $0.10. Cents. So it's very easy. We have to restructure the way we tax earnings in this country, because our current tax system encourages earnings uh, derived here in Australia to go offshore and then we turn around 
and we give a tax break to banks to lend money onshore. So if anyone understands what a balance sheet looks like, that means we encourage foreign debt and we push domestic equity offshore. Now, let me tell you something. Debt is slavery and equity is freedom. If we want to make sure our children grow up in the prosperous country that we grew up in, that our forefathers built for us, we have to reform our tax system. And the last thing we need to look at most of all, and it's the least understood of all these measures, is our monetary policy. Basically, there are three levers to control monetary policy, and that's qualitative easing, or qualitative, quantitative, and then macroprudential. I'll touch on macroprudential first. Uh, in 1985, Paul Keating lifted the capital controls in this country. That meant, and according to the Parliamentary Budget Office, in 1995, uh, the um, Australian government had $8 billion in debt, uh, and by uh, uh, and then by 2008, they had $36 billion in, eight in debt. But here's the thing: with banks, the banks had $6 billion in debt in 1985. By 2008, they had eight. Hundred billion dollars in foreign debt. In foreign debt. Now, is that the right thing to do? No, it isn't, because our actual uh, one and only Banking Royal Commission said in 1937. So, note, I'm referring to the only Banking Royal Commission. There was another one in 2016 that dealt with corruption in the banking, financial, and superannuation industry. But the actual real Banking Commission, and this is what set Australia up for prosperity throughout the 60s and 70s said, the most desirable banking system in the present circumstances of Australia is one in which includes privately owned trading banks. The system contemplated is one in which a strong central bank regulates the volume of credit. The volume of credit and the distribution of credit is left to privately owned trading banks. What does the volume of credit mean, Deputy Speaker, Deputy Chair? It means that on a balance sheet, okay, You've got debt and you've got equity. And the, what we did in 1985, or what Paul Keating did in 1985, he moved all the macroprudential controls, lifted all the capital controls, and just let the banks rip. They went out and borrowed $800 billion instead of enforcing that corporations and banks use domestic savings. Use domestic savings. Now, if we want to actually increase supply instead of destroying demand, which is what the RBA is doing. We need to issue credit. Now, there's two types. Well, we need to issue new capital. There's two ways to issue capital. You can either issue bonds or you could issue shares. Now, for some strange reason, governments only ever issue bonds. Yet, governments, sovereign governments at least, have title over all the land. So the question is, why don't they issue new shares against sovereign infrastructure? Okay. And that sovereign infrastructure, of course, is power stations, dams, road, rail, ports, airports and te telecommunications. Okay? Corporations issue new shares all the time. A mining company might want to open up a new mine. It will issue a new share. So how do we go about uh, implementing this idea? We issue one share in a bank called Infrastructure Bank. And that, company, and that share will be owned by our children called Untapped Wealth. And then when that infrastructure bank can lend to federal governments or state governments. So that, say, for example, the state government wants to build a dam for a billion dollars. If the infrastructure bank that's owned by the Australian people lends, makes a loan to the state government for 100 years at 1 per cent, that means that the first billion dollars in wealth that the state government makes, it gets to actually repay to the federal government. The key point here is that that first billion dollars in wealth stays within Australia. Because right now we go and tap the world's biggest market, of course, which is the U.S. Treasury bond market. The U.S. Treasury bond market is money that is printed by the Federal Reserve, privately owned banks in the states. It's not actually the U.S. dollars it's printing; it's the actual privately owned banks' dollars it's printing. And every time we create new infrastructure assets here, when we repay that debt, we let all that wealth go offshore. Thank Authorised G. Rennick, LMP Chermside.